So if you don't mind, I would I would sit here because I have so many papers. If I start, if I go there, then they might fly all around the room. Um, I'd like to also thank uh, the organizers and uh, Comas for inviting me here. My name is uh, Irzak Rita, and please uh, feel free to call me Rita in a simple way. Um, and this is my first time actually in Asia. Uh, the reason for this is not that I am not interested in the region or I didn't have intentions to come, but I didn't have the possibility. So I really appreciate this one week here and I'm trying to get as much um, inputs and information as possible from you and also from my other visits. I think it's important to say here that this is not an official UN visit. Um, I will talk a little bit Thank you. I will talk a little bit about what I do at the UN, um, and part of our activities is to conduct official country visits, where we, are, where we arrive on the invitation of the government, and then we come up with a country report, which is presented to the Human Rights Council. Now, this time, as it was said, I came on the invitation of Comas, so it doesn't mean, it, it means that I won't issue a country report, so please don't look in the documentation in the next few months looking for a detailed assessment on Malaysia, because I won't be able to do it, but I would like to um, emphasize once again that I would be very happy to come back in my official visit, uh, in my official capacity if the government is ready to accept me and I'm very happy and, um, and grateful that two ministers actually, one already gave his time to meet me yesterday, um, the Minister for National Unity and Integration in the Prime Minister's office and I'm still uh, to meet the Minister in the Prime Minister's Department on Human Rights and I very much appreciate that they, that they give me their um, precious time to sit and discuss also from the government point of view. So I am trying to, to talk to all kinds of uh, stakeholders in Malaysia to get a, to get a nice um, and full picture of, of what's going on here. When I arrived, um, the first time when I was taken out for a dinner, um, I passed by a poster uh, which I also mentioned a bit earlier. And this poster advertised, I think, a theater piece, right? It was a film? It was a theater. It was a theater piece. And then it was a poster which said, which was a, a caricature, and then it said that in, Mala in Malaysia, the race is, your race is who you are. And I was very interested because that was the first public sign that I actually saw. It's a green very easy to, to, to recognize poster. And it really made me think because it was about uh, three different ethnic groups in the country and it was very, it, it, it used some typical languages, which I understand that typical languages here, to be, um, descri to describe uh, the, the various groups. And then when I started having meetings with people, then I was alerted that be careful because this is very sensitive in Malaysia. And if you talk about minorities and racism, people will feel very uneasy with you and very uncomfortable. And I was trying to reassure my, my friends and colleagues that this is a case everywhere I travel. Um, ethnic, linguistic, religious, cultural identities are always very, very sensitive. And the, the very reason for it is that because this is part of our identity. We are very sensitive of who we are, which includes our name, our age, and then, of course, comes the family, the, the, the family, the, the language that we use at home, the customs that we respect, the religious holidays that we observe. So this is part of us. So, of course, we don't want to be um, ridiculed, humiliated, misunderstood, um, untolerated because of that. So everywhere I travel, this is an issue. Um, but I can also tell you that there are places where people are actually going to extreme to hurt each other, including my country. But in 2008 and 2009, uh, there was a serial killings against one particular minority group um, to which I belong to, which are the Roma people. And there were serial attacks against um, Roma families, innocent Roma families during the night, where extreme rightist groups um, were throwing Molotov cocktails on sleeping people. And when they wanted to flee their houses, they were shot, including a four years old boy. So it doesn't, but I'm telling you that it's sensitive. It's really sensitive also in Europe. Some people don't, I mean, it's, it's always believed that um, these issues can only happen in Rwanda or, you know, in South Africa or in Bosnia. These things happen everywhere. 
But it's really up to the government how it can handle the diversity. And I was very happy to learn from my government partners that, that <clears throat> they believe that there is a unity in Malaysia which has to be preserved and upheld, but there is already, uh, there are not such big problems that we can hear, for example, from Hungary. I mean, I just had a very uh, extreme example of that. And I, and I hope that, that, um, that uh, I will find um, this also through my, through my visit in the country. Of course, I'm always confronted by the question, who are the minorities? Who are you protecting? And I think it's interesting and, uh, to reflect that um, the United Nations in 1945 was also born because of the tragical um, experiences of the Second World War and the Holocaust, where Jews and Roma and, 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 and homosexuals and disabled people and other was, others were killed. And this is when the UN realized that people can be targets because of their ethnic and religious affiliation. So since that time, the establishment of the UN, that was one of the core concerns. Despite the fact the UN has not come to any agreement on either a definition on minorities or even to a legally binding document. It took almost, well, I'm not good in mathematics, many years until 1992 where a declaration on minorities was adopted. Uh, this is a declaration, it's not legally binding. Nevertheless, it's a document that was uh, unanimously adopted by all the governments, and now this is what guides my work as well. But when I am pushed to give an explanation who are the minorities, we, the international minority rights uh, I don't know, activists, are, uh, we tend to use one definition, which I will read for you, and then I will also tell you why this is not a, a perfect definition at all. And this is something that comes from uh, Francesco Capotorti from uh, 1977, who was in charge at the UN to try to come up with a definition, and he said the following. A group numerically inferior to the rest of the population of a state in a non-dominant position whose members, being nationals of the state, possess ethnic, religious, or linguistic characteristics differing from those of the rest of the population and show, if only implicitly, a sense of solidarity directed towards preserving their culture, traditions, religion, or language. Is this better? We'll see. Okay. So if you look at the definition, what does it say to us? That there are groups in a state who have distinct characteristics. And there is also a criteria that this group has to have a wish to preserve these characteristics. Now, if you look at the definition, it's interesting to see that it includes that this group has to be numerically inferior. Now, history showed us that it is not true, that many times minorities can be actually more in number and can be still oppressed. Um, and if you look at South Africa, it's easy to understand why we are not using any more the numerical criteria. It doesn't mean much. You can outnumber others, but you can still be the oppressed community. So we are not looking anymore at numbers as such. Then this definition also says that these minority members have to be nationals of the state. Now, what we also realized during all these years that many times um, deprivation of citizenship is actually a tool to discriminate minorities. So there are minority people in certain states who are punished by not um, enjoying citizenship. So we also had to get rid of this criteria of having being citizens of nationals because many times this is a manifestation of an already existing um, discrimination. So what stays today as a criteria for me to work with is that I am covering national, ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities, as it is in the UN Declaration. And what am I looking at is their position in the, in the, in the, in the state. And if they are non-dominant, and they, if they shout for help, then this is a minority which I will need to protect, and I will look at them. Now, I also often receive the question, what about the aboriginals, the indigenous, the First Nations people? And I have to tell you that in the UN system, um, we treat them separately. Because indigenous people, the definition is different. They are the ones who arrived before the colonial powers. They are the ones who have strong attachment to land and their, their ancestors. 
Minorities, of course, have access to land, but it's not the same because it, they don't use the land the same way. So we, we tend to, to um, distinct this, uh, these two, and I don't work on abor and indigenous issues, but I work on minorities. As I said, um, I am guided by the United Nations Declaration on Minorities. I think you have a copy in your folder. It's a very short document, but I think it's very important to look at the key messages within because it really helps us understanding the context. What I need to do at the UN, in my UN position, is to promote the implementation of this declaration. How can I promote this? One tool that I can use is to receive complaints from communities and NGOs. We have a confidential complaint mechanism, which means that I have an email address and I receive uh, complaints about human rights allegations already happened or about to um, happen from various sources and then I can address the governments and I can write a letter of concern, allegation letter to the government and tell them that this is what I hear, and can you please inform me whether the facts that I heard are true, and what are you trying to do to remedy the situation, bring justice, um, and defend the victims. These are confidential communications, so it's between me and the state government. But after a while, they become uh, public. So if you Google joint communications report, just like that, you will get a lot of, um, actually all the communications that we, the independent expert or special reporters, it's the same thing, but two different names. So whatever we send to the governments, you will see them. You will see the summary of our uh, letter, and you will also see the response of the government. Now the sad uh, fact is that uh, not all governments reply, and sometimes when they reply, it's not always satisfactory. Um, we receive about 50-60% um, replies to our concerns, depending on the mandate, depending on the issue, of course, and depending on the country. You can have very nice uh, statistics that are already available if you, if you want to know more about, about these tendencies. The second thing I do, I, as I mentioned, is that I can carry out country visits, official country visits. As I said, these are based on the invitation of the government, and I can spend usually up to two weeks in a country, traveling around, and then issuing a country visit. Um, the third thing I do, I am requested to produce thematic reports on an annual basis. I prepare one report to the Human Rights Council every March, and one report to the General Assembly every October, which I present in New York. The next report to the GA in New York will be about religious minorities, which I think ver would be very important and interesting for, for you as well. It is not yet public. It will take a few weeks until it's interpreted and translated into the, the six official languages, five apart from English. And of course, it has to undergo some editing and, uh, and proofreading. But very soon, it will be ready. And then I, I, I hope to share it with you then. So I'm producing thematic reports, and as Gerard said, you already have um, two of them in your folders. And then I have one very special privilege and responsibility to do, which is to guide the work of the United Nations Forum on Minority Issues. This is the only thing that we have in the UN for minorities. It is a gathering of about 500 people um, at the end of November every year in Geneva. It lasts for two days, which is very short. We struggle to, to finish our agenda. And I am in charge to choose the topic, the theme of each session, and also to the speakers and, and to, to set up the agenda. And this year, because um, I will talk about it, most of the complaints I receive actually come from religious minorities. I also decided to focus the forum, the minority forum on religious minorities. And you are very much welcome to look at the website and to um, try to get to Geneva. I have a small budget, um, which is uh, provided by the Austrian and the Hungarian governments for all these years. And I can usually cover the participation of about 20 experts, which is very, very few. But of course, NGOs um, can have their own ways and, and donors to have them come to, to Geneva and speak at the forum. So those who have um, the resources, please do consider to come and to contact me if you want to submit any documents for the forum. The agenda will be also published uh, very soon on, on my website. Um, I would like to talk to you very briefly about what does it mean to protect minorities and what are the basic issues that I am looking at. And I would just highlight a few which might be uh, interesting in, in your context and in the region. Um, so one of them, uh, one thing I also need to say that um, 
there is a, um, a human rights committee um, statement on who are the minorities in a country because some, as you know, some member states do not acknowledge that they have any minorities in their territory. And it's important to say that the Human Rights Committee said that the existence of an ethnic, religious, or linguistic minority in a given state party does not depend upon a decision by that state party, but requires to be established by objective criteria. So even there are member states who do not say in the constitution or in the legislation that they have minorities, I still have the opportunity to look at it because there are some objective criteria which can show that there are minorities in the country. So that's just for the, the, the conceptual framework. Now for the, for the minority protection context, what does it mean? How do we protect minorities? Um, there are four pillars. It doesn't include all the issues, but I will focus on them to give you the, the bone um, of, 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 of this, um, this um, whole framework. One of them is the protection of existence of minorities. I will talk about it. The second one is the promotion and the protection of identity. The third one is non-discrimination and equality. And the fourth one is the right to participation. So I will go through one, some of these. Now, existence. What do we mean under protecting existence? As Kofi Annan said um, previously, is that unfortunately minorities are genocide's most frequent targets. And again, if you look at Rwanda, if you look at Srebrenica in Bosnia and Herzegovina, you will see that those who are mass murdered um, and, uh, and, and have undergone uh, um, genocide, they are minorities. Unfortunately, we have to be very careful because minorities tend to be the ones who are attacked. Um, but it's not only the, the genocide situation, but even before conflict situation, we must be very careful to look at conflicts. And as I said, I will talk about this in my next report because I am very alarmed by the security situation of religious minorities. I'm not talking about security situation in a country and about who causes what. It's, it's not my, my mandate to look at it. But just to protect the religious minorities is a very core issue at the moment. And it requires a lot of positive measures from the states, uh, including um, um, understanding the situation of these religious minorities and the security concerns, monitoring non-state actors that might incite religious intolerance or violence, and they also have to establish relevant oversight procedures and training programs. Um, it, is, uh, it is very important to say that religious minorities are always at greater risk of, um, of security concerns, both in times of peace and during conflict and post-conflict uh, contexts. And I also must say, based on the allegations I received, that in a word of this increasing uh, sectarianism, um, vigilance regarding the vulnerability of minorities within minorities and intra-religious and inter-domination tangents is also necessary. We must pay attention to that. Um, it's not only good to pay attention to security issues, but actually this is one of the core um, foundations of minority rights protection. There is a there is a commentary to the UN Declaration on Minorities, and it says, actually also the, the declaration itself in the preamble, that the promotion and the protection of the rights of persons belonging to minorities contribute to the political and social stability of states, and also to the peace among nations. So I think it's very important to keep in mind. So um, moving from the protection of existence, um, I would like to talk a little bit about the protection and promotion of identity. Now note the word promotion. Promotion goes beyond protection. It doesn't only mean that you protect the people can f um, freely use their language or appear in their religious dresses or observe their religious um, um, cultural festivals, but it means that states have an obligation to promote it, to help minorities to, um, to enjoy these rights. Um, this includes mother tongue education. I know this is also something that came up in Malaysia many times. Um, and then you have my report on linguistic minorities in your folder. And I actually said, which is in the commentary of the declaration, that denying minorities the possibility of learning their own language and of receiving instruction in their own language or excluding them um, 
excluding from their education the transmission of knowledge about their own culture, history, tradition, and language would be a violation of the obligation to protect their identity. So know that this is not only to learn their language, but it's to get instruction in their own language. If you look at UNICEF's um, uh, publications, you will find that they also encourage bilingual education from the earliest years of schooling. And they say that it will ensure that minority children become proficient in their mother tongue and the dominant language from an early age. Um, teaching children from a recommended six to eight years in their mother tongue and gradually introducing national languages has advantages, including the following. Children learn better. They are more confident. They are well equipped to transfer their literacy and numeracy skills to additional languages. Children experience less frustration and failure and fewer drop out of school. And by including families and drawing on local cultural heritage, mother tongue based education contributes to community social and cultural well being and fosters inclusiveness within wider society. Um, however, not many countries have adopted bilingual learning approaches, and this is something that I am I'm trying to promote also through my work. Now, Using your language is not only important in education, but of course also at court procedures, access to justice, and media is something very important, as well as information. If there are communities who don't speak the national language, it's very important to uh, prepare leaflets about basic services in their own mother tongue so they understand it and they have access to all these basic services in a country. Um, um, let's jump a little bit on religious uh, identity. This is very, this is very um, um, sensitive, I, I'm aware of that. Religious identity and manifestations include the possessions of religious literature. I am receiving a lot of complaints when these are taken away, um, and actually people are in prison because of possession of religious literature. There is a right to assemble and worship freely, whatever religion you belong to. It doesn't matter whether it's officially recognized in a country, if you belong to religious minorities, you have your right to practice your religion um, freely or your faith, or not to do so if you, um, if you are not a believer. I think it's important to say. Protection of religious property. I am receiving many complaints which are very um, saddening about churches, temples, mosques being destroyed. Um, even cemeteries many times are completely ruined, even used for uh, business purposes. This is something that concerns me a lot. Um, holidays and celebrations. Religious minorities have to have the right to freely celebrate um, and, uh, and keep their religious holidays and customs and traditions. And then again, we, can, we have to come back to the schools and the teachings. Minority children have a right to get education about their own religions, and they should not be forced to, te uh, to learn about other um, um, faiths and religions than their own if they don't wish so. There are countries who are pushing children to learn only about one and the dominant religion, but there should be a right uh, granted to minority children to learn about their own faith uh, or belief or religion. Now, coming to non-discrimination and equality, I realize also in the, in the movie that there is a lot, I think a lot of discussion going on in non-discrimination and equality, which is good, and I won't spend too much time. What I would like to say here is that, as you can see, minor, minority protection goes beyond non-discrimination. It's not only to, to let people do whatever and don't interfere. It's much more. It's about positive action and affirmative action, and I know you are familiar because it's, 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 it's something that is used in this country. Um, now, for affirmative action, there are also um, many um, uh, guidance that, I, that we can turn to, and I know that I noticed that there is a um, campaign going on for the CERD ratification, and I would like to quote CERD, what CERD says about affirmative action, and it says that for the sole purpose of securing adequate advancement of certain racial or ethnic groups or individuals requiring such protection as may be necessary, in order to ensure such groups or individuals equal enjoyment of exercise of human rights and fundamental freedoms. So affirmative action is not contrary um, with the third um, convention, um, which is the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination in Long. It's actually possible, but of course it has criteria. It has to be temporary, it has to be fair, and it has to be justified. Um, the Human Rights Con uh, Committee also talked about um, affirmative action and temporary special measures, as it says in its general comment 18. 
And then it said that um, state parties are sometimes required to take affirmative action in order to diminish or eliminate conditions which cause or help to perpetuate discrimination prohibited by the covenant, and that such action may involve granting for a time to the part of the population concerned certain um, preferential treatment in specific matters as compared with the rest of the population, as long as such action is needed to correct discrimination in fact. So this is what, um, there are some other guidelines, but I, I found these two very important to, to, to mention here. And then participation, you have also a report in your folder about participation, I won't go long into that. Um, but of course participation has to be ensured in all fields of life, um, again starting from education to employment, public life, the right to stand for elections, the right to be voted for, um, cultural life, economic uh, participation, uh, whether you have the same access to land and property as the others, this is very, very crucial. Now, these are the pillars that I mentioned. Now, what are the tools that, um, that uh, member states and of course the partners of member states should do? And just to mention a few without having an exhaustive list, uh, the first of all, of course, is mapping. It's gathering data, and if possible, disaggregated data, to know who live in the country. Now, apart from the US and the UK, it's a challenge everywhere, I acknowledge. It's very difficult to get data everywhere I travel. Um, if you want to know how many black American women study PhD, you can get it uh, from the States on Google. If you want to know how many black or how many Indian or Sikh um, religious people work in the um, police force in the UK, you can get it. Now, whether you can get the same data in anywhere else, whether I would be able to know how many people um, um, speak Chinese in Malaysia, I'm not sure, but definitely in my country, it's something very sensitive and difficult to get. What we are trying to do that during the census, when there is a household survey, then of course most member states are gathering data. But it's important to remember that this data collection must be voluntarily. It must not be by any pressure on, on those who are giving data. And uh, it has to be self-identification. It's not good to go and count people on your assumption whether they belong to this group or not based on an appearance or based on the language. People's identities are very own. You can't tell from outside. Somebody might look like this, but be somebody completely different inside. There are also people who change it. They get married, they change their religion. Um, sometimes, including in my family, who is partly Roma, some of my Roma family members would not say that they are Roma because they don't feel like Roma. So you can't push them to, to say um, that they are if they are, don't feel this way. So censuses are a very good way to know who, are, who live in a country but it must be voluntarily and it must, there are data protection tools uh, which require that those who give the data should not be identifiable anymore together with the data. So you should be able to tell how many people from which background, which ethnicity, which religion, which language, but you should not be able to link it with the person because we have seen from historical experiences that it can really lead to some tragical events when people are being uh, harassed or even executed based on those uh, data. Um, so it's important to know who are living, not in the country, but also in a municipality or in the school, who are the school boards. Okay, thank you. The second one is legislative protection, to have legislation in the country. This is, of course, a basic, and the legislation needs to come with implementation, otherwise it, it doesn't make much sense to have just symbolic commitments. Then institutional tension, what does it mean? Uh, it's very, very important um, to have institutions that are dealing with these issues, whether we call it racism or integration or unity or minority issues, it's important that there is a body in the government, in the National Human Rights Commission, in the municipality, uh, in the Ombudsman's offices if there is any, to deal with this. It's also good for data collection, but it's also good of course for monitoring and evaluation later. If there is no institutional attention to these issues, many times it just doesn't get the necessary attention. And then the last that I would mention is consultation, which of course we can't emphasize enough uh, times. Um, you can't plan good programs uh, and policy, and it includes of course all of us, all the stakeholders, if you don't involve those communities who are affected by it. And consultation process has to be there from the planning through the implementation and the evaluation. And this includes also intercultural and interfaith dialogue. And in my next report I will um, also 
to the GA, I will also describe a little bit of the importance of interreligious and interfaith dialogue and the role of religious leaders. Um, this is not something that the state can many times do, but the state can definitely facilitate and help uh, to have an intercultural dialogue which will bring communities um, more together. And I understand that actually here um, the Prime Minister's office is doing a lot of programs and activities to bring communities together so that they can enjoy and learn from each other, which I, which I uh, find a, a very good tool um, for understanding and mutual respect. And I was told that my time is up, so I will stop here, and then of course I'm available for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.